Come on in, find yourself a spot. Welcome to Calvary Church Nampa. As you settle in, let me just briefly introduce myself. My name is Anders. I'm one of the pastor elders here. Such a joy to be able to worship together with you this morning. It's such an honor to, to lead and to serve here. Um, but yeah, as we gather, I, I just want to again welcome you. If you're new or visiting, uh, we we'll invite you to check out in front of you in the pew something we pretty simply call the card. We do, mostly for my sake, try to keep things pretty simple around here. But uh, the card is just a chance to get a little contact information. And our purpose in that is not to toss it in a file somewhere. The purpose in that is to actually know you and to find out what God's doing in your life, to see if there's a way that we can connect and hear your story and share ours or whatever would be of an encouragement and, and help to you. So um, please, if you don't mind, fill that out. Let us know what's going on. And if you've been around a while, you'll know that on the backside there is a space for comments, for prayer requests. We just love to know what's going on in your lives, too. So that's just another means of letting us know uh, how to be praying for you and in your corner uh, as shepherds. Um, just wanted to walk alongside. Please let us uh, have that opportunity. And we do. We take it seriously. We take those things before the Lord. Um, I want to share with you just a few things that are going on as we begin. Uh, there's a couple things to highlight. First of all, if you are a, a covenant member with us, I hope that you've had today on your calendar. We are staying after the service for a short family meeting. That's our, our business meeting as we get together and just talk about what the Lord's been doing. And Today after the service. Also, I want to let you know uh, a date that we just really want to start to zero in on now as the summer's starting to kind of get moving. Uh, July 10th. July 10th. Everybody say July 10th. July 10th. Okay, just so I know you've got it. That's a Saturday, and uh, that's going to be our fourth annual. I couldn't believe we were talking about the fourth annual uh, Calgary Nampa Car Show. So the car show is just an opportunity. We have cars of, of all sorts coming here to the church. And the chance to build bridges into our community, meet folks, and just offer our neighborhood and folks around um, a special time, something fun to do, and as a kind of a gift to the community and a chance for us to, to know folks and to, to uh, spend time together. So we'd love for all of you to be there. Um, we'd love for all of you to represent well our church in that, in that time. There's nothing like sitting around in no hurry, leaning on a car or not touching it, depending on what they want from you. But, uh, but shoot the breeze and, and spend the time. And you know what? It's one thing to talk weather. It's another thing to talk about the real things of life. And so you, as, as our body, have the chance to represent Christ, to uh, show his love and care. And so I just want to invite you to come. But listen, there's a lot to do before then. So uh, it's, it's great if we all come. But what we really, really would like is to have like anybody and everybody come. So... There's going to be some opportunities to get the word out. would love for you to uh, begin kind of now until that time. Uh, we'll have flyers available. And you can have those in your car, in your purse, or whatever. And, and just wherever you might be, if you're in an opportunity, say, hey, you know what? You might like this. Come join us. Just, uh, just being an invitational people. So July 10th, car show. There's going to be a lot of need for help that day. And, uh, and, and setting up and cleaning up. So talk to Shauna. Talk to myself. Or talk to Dale Sugar who's leading that out with us again this year. If you would like to be involved, then we'll find a way to, to connect you to that. I um, also want to just kind of give a big thank you to those of you who served with us yesterday. If you don't know, if you might be looking around, there's probably a few more like red cheeks and red necks and arms. We were outdoors at the park yesterday, um, kind of a block party. And listen, it was a good day. The Lord gave us good weather and a chance to, again, be in the community. The jumpy houses were a hit people that we were able to just meet in our neighborhood and so the, the deal is though it takes a lot of work to do that and I look around this room and I see many of you who helped out and I want to say a big thank you for your efforts your blood sweat and tears as I've been saying and I uh, want to just appreciate you for doing that but again not only like setting things up and being there serving but again loving people well so yesterday was a good day and we'll just pray that the Lord will do with that as he pleases other than that, I just want to invite you to keep your eyes on the Summer Reconnect board. Uh, I think there was a pinochle night, Friday night, that was fun. And there's going to be just chances to connect with one another. And, and we want to get you beyond just sort of the, the short conversations on a Sunday morning and actually have some shared experiences together. So let those relationships build and go deeper. Maybe there's some people in this room and in this church that you've not spent a lot of time with. Well, these uh, Connect events give you opportunities to try something, do something, and see who else is there. 
and uh, just, just have some shared experiences. So there's a variety of them. If you've got ideas for things that will just be going on throughout the summer that you'd like to lead a Connect event, we'd love to have those ideas uh, be just told to the office, and then we can set that up and invite others into that, whether that's a fishing day or a hike or a, a softball game or anything that might be something to do. And I know there's a lot of ideas stirring. And so summer reconnect. It's a good time to continue to press into one of our values, which is to connect with one another authentically. So when you're together, don't just uh, say hello. Go meet. Find out about each other. Find out what life is like for, for somebody not known and, and love them well. So that's enough in terms of what's going on for now. I just wanted to put those things out in front of you. And really, those are things that we can celebrate God at work among us. And there's uh, more coming. But listen, let's just set our hearts in worship, even as we think about what he has done, what he is doing, what he's going to do in the future. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our service this morning. And and have him just dominate this time. Let's pray. Lord, you truly are the living God. And who are we to come before you to have any hope that you would pay attention to us or know us or, or any of that? And yet, as you've revealed yourself, as you've told your own story and introduced yourself to us in your self-revelation through the, the creation all around, through your word in front of us, we know that in Jesus Christ you have desired us and wanted us to be with you and know you and find life eternal. So Lord, through Jesus, we would just boldly come before your throne and we would make the request that this time, here and now, which we've already done the hard work of setting aside and getting here, and, Lord, would you bless it? And, and, and bless it in such a way that we can tell that, that you're moving, that you're real and that we can enjoy you. And I just pray that everyone who's here would find themselves just awakened to your, your beauty and your love, that we'd be able to build one another up, that there would be an endurance and a persevering that would come out of this, that we can walk in such a way as to correspond with how you treated us. And so, God, I just pray that you would hear us and bless us and be here. You're the one we want to know and see and be around. There's no one like you, Jesus. And so we live your name up and we ask you to have it this time and make it special to make it useful for the body so we can be useful in your hands to announce to the world how good you are all these things we pray and hope and enjoy in the grace of Jesus Christ and in that powerful name we pray Amen, Amen. Good morning, I want to read a scripture to us as we begin, it's out of Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 8. Paul says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So who are the Gentiles? That's us, right? So God's been at work and his people that he might call us to himself. It goes on and says, as it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, us again, and sing to your name. And again, it is said, verse 10, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, verse 11, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And let all the people be sold him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. So I didn't fill all those empty spaces with Gentiles. That's what the scripture says over and over. In the last verse, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I want to call us to an intentionality this morning, a purposefulness in our worship that we would be all present. Again, whatever situation you come from, but this is a time that we can bring focus to worship. Uh, my daughter sent me a text a while back, Anna. She said, you know, Dad, we trust God to keep in order all the cosmos around us. I think something like the earth is spinning 6,000 miles an hour, certainly the sun at 10,000 miles an hour. You know, I don't know if those numbers are exactly right, but the point is, wow. 
I'm trying to keep a car on the road, you know, at 65, 70 miles an hour on the highway, and we've got the cosmos spinning around, and who do we trust that is keeping all of that in order? God. And she said, you know, Dad, can you not trust him? She was preaching to me. She said, Dad, can we not trust him to run our lives? Yeah, yeah, we can. That one really gave me some pause. I didn't think about that. God has for us in order to worship him this morning. He set it up through Jesus Christ to do that. He's the one that does that in us. It's not something, again, we have to stir up in ourselves. But God does that through his spirit. He calls us to believe. He calls us to be intentional in him. To worship him this morning during this specific time that we have. So worship with us, would you?
sanctuary. Praise him in the sky which testifies to his strength. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the blast of a horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and with dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and the flute. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. See you. 
Father, we we read the scriptures. It's true where the disciples and people were worshiping and praising you in the book of Acts. And you shook the place where they were standing. We read of prison doors because the foundations were shook, were flung open. God, would, would we not expect anything less from you today in the 21st century? God of all gods, King of all kings. Lord, would you shape our lives individually for you and towards you? God, that we might be an instrument used in your hands. God, that we would be image bearers of Christ himself. God, we even say humbly, thank you for this time we've been able to worship you together as the body of Christ. Amen. You know, as I was worshiping here this morning, the words that came to my voice is, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Is he worthy? Yes. Is he worthy? Yes. He is indeed worthy. Let's take this time and let's lift that up to him in a personal manner. This is your time to spend your heart and line your heart with him and to share that. All that he's given, all that he's done, all that he is doing. And yes, all that he has promised, it's now our time to say, not only are you worthy, but Heavenly Father, we praise you. We lift your name up on high. We thank you that you're a personal God that allows us to have a relationship with you, that you desire that, and that you call us to yourself. You provide for our every need. You watch over us. You guide us. You control the situations around us. And for that, Father, we say thank you. So as we come to this time where we can worship you through our giving, may it be our hearts, our love for you, that we return back to you because you first gave it to us. And we give the glory, the honor, and the praise in Christ's precious name. Please join me as we read God's Word. Our passage today is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, which can be found on page 579 of the Black Pew Bibles. If you need a Bible, please take one out of the pew. If you don't have one at home, please keep it as a gift from us. Again, the passage today is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance.
actually are not just beginning, we're continuing as we study in the book of 2 Timothy. And I'd like to, uh, to ask you as we begin this time of study and learning and growing, I wonder if you've ever been to, to a funeral, but to the kind that really meant something to you. Um, I know that there's times when a, a sacred moment like that can can leave us thinking and, and be impacted, to be inspired in certain ways. Now, now maybe if you're thinking on this topic as I bring this up, there are some kinds of funerals when it's, it's so close to heart that there's kind of a grief that wearies and blinds us and, and there's a numbness in our thinking and perhaps leaving a moment like that, you, you don't come away with any clarity of thought or any particular inspiration. But I wonder if you've ever had the kind where maybe it's just a, a little bit more distant, somebody that you, you knew of or, or, or around, and, and then in the moments of seeing and hearing about the details of their life, you realize that they lived for something, and that there was deep meaning in the kind of people they were and the kind of legacy they left behind. I, I'm thinking in my own case, of a, a couple that was important in my, my family's life, in the discipling of my, my mom in particular, but in my parents. And in 2015, he passed away, and in 2017, she passed away. And I was in a season of my own life trying to ask questions of kind of my calling and where do I belong in the kingdom. And in 2015, in that kind of a season of life, to go to a funeral where a life was well lived for Jesus Christ and for things that last and things that matter, I almost left with this sense of, of desire, almost like jealousy, like I want to be able to get there and say I lived my life like that. Have you ever been impacted by a person like that? And then two years later, when she passed away, I had the exact same thing in this pair of funerals over the course of two years, just as I was coming into a season of my own ministry, was, was super impactful. And it was impactful specifically because I could see a, a trail behind this life well lived of people impacted and people that were like locked arms and lived together for something that really mattered. And I was like, man... I want to be able to say I locked arms and partnered and I have people that over the course of the long haul live like that. So that's part of my own experience and, and I know it's a heavy way to start a sermon, but I don't know if you heard the passage read. We're here in the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy and it is a personal letter from Paul to Timothy. And Paul's nearing the end. Paul is nearing the end. This is a personal letter with a personal focus. And as we focus today on verses 5 through 8, he's saying the time of my departure is near. So perhaps it's right that we carry into this text the same kind of feel, sense of the, the impact of these kind of words, and, and seek for that kind of inspiration of a life well lived. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to look at this um, handful of verses, verses 5 through 8, really in two parts. The first part is basically a here's what you do. And the second part is here's why. Here's what you do, Timothy. And that's going to be focused particularly in verse 5. And then he's going to spend verses 6, 7, and 8 talking about here's why. So, in, in a sense, let me just give you a preview of kind of what's going on here. We'll put it into these words. It's, it's as if this text has something to say, kind of like this. And then I want to show you and see if the text actually bears it out. Paul talking to Timothy. Now you, you do your part. You fulfill your ministry. You finish strong. I have kept the faith. I have run my race. He's going to say. And so he's telling Timothy, now you do your part because I won't always be here and it's worth it. You do your part because I will not always be here and it's worth it. So 
So that's kind of the statement that we're going to be working with as we deal with these two parts. What to do and why. But see, here's the problem, even as we begin to kind of think this through. The problem is that we, as ones hindered by and affected deeply to the root of who we are by sin, you see, we easily forget. We easily get distracted. We, we run out of steam. We, we can get swayed or, or, or pulled off course or deceived even. Or sometimes our faith flags or wanes or wavers. Sometimes our resolve runs low. And we don't see things through or finish strong. Because the reality is that in our case, even though we may have high desires, we're, we're unfaithful. We're weak and we're fickle. But here's what God does about this. Well, for one thing, He gives us letters like this one. He gives us words like these. So I want to acknowledge who we are, acknowledge what we, we ache for, each of us seeking to have legacy, meaning, and purpose. And let these words begin to help us for the long haul. For a journey like this. So as we consider who we are and what life's about, let's, let's let God speak to us through his word. So that you and I might, as we'll see, keep the faith. You ready? We're going to start in verse 5. Let's look down again. Let's read verse 5 together. Chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Paul is going to say to Timothy, As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. I lost my place as I read. I would be the losers. Here we go. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Can't you sense that Paul is telling Timothy, here's what you do, Timothy. And he starts it off by saying, as for you. Now, if you've been with us or if you've not, it's okay. This is all going to work together for today. But, but we've noticed as we're working through this letter, passage by passage, that many times Paul is making this a very personal letter and bringing it back to Timothy. So he starts off with this contrast. And as for you, well, what is he contrasting against? It's sort of as if Paul is saying, you know, forget about that or forget about them. You worry about you. Like that's who you're responsible for. But he's not calling Timothy to, to forget about anyone or anything. He's not just saying, you do, you just lock yourselves in and nothing else matters. We know that because Paul is giving himself as an example. You look at my own life, Timothy. So he's not saying, don't ignore me, which he's just been doing earlier in the chapter when he says, you followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, etc. And we also know that he's not calling Timothy to ignore all others because in chapter 2, twice he mentions others, where he says in verse 22, Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, and love, along with those who call on the Lord out of your heart. So you do this thing that you're doing, Timothy, along with others. Or in the second verse of chapter 2, Paul is telling him not only to have others around you, but he's also saying, the things I'm passing on to you as you stay tuned to me, you put those in the hands of faithful men who will then pass them on to others. So, when he says, but as for you, he's not telling Timothy, put on blinders and forget all others. Who is he contrasting against it? We'll look up one verse into chapter 4 where we just left off. I mean, chapter 4, verse 4. See, he's talking about those who will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. And as he's talking about the fact that that kind of thing exists, those who will no longer reasonably listen to the truth... They'll bring around teachers, they'll tell them whatever they want to hear, even if it's true or not true. They're going to wander away, but as for you, you see, that's who he's contrasting against. He's saying, watch out for that, and Timothy, you then focus in, you, you let the noise of all that other stuff set aside, but as for you, here's what you do. Okay, you see what he's doing there? So he opens with that phrase to draw contrast. And then he's basically saying, listen, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. And he gives it in four parts. So 
So let's look at what he says for just a moment and make sure we understand. As for you, always be sober-minded, number one. Endure suffering, number two. Do the work of evangelist, number three. And fulfill your ministry, number four. So he's calling Timothy, first of all, to this, this sober-mindedness. Now, what would that mean? I mean, the words used literally have to do with sober, like, like clear-mindedness. It's meant figuratively. Like this word could be used actually about being under the influence of something. And he's calling him not to be. But it's used as a figurative way of talking about being calm and collected in his spirit, in the inner person. It's about being temperate or dispassionate. Not to say that passion doesn't matter, but not being caught up into other things that might cloud the thinking. Being circumspect. So it's about and relating to the idea of being awake, being, being alert. So when he says, Timothy, listen. If you're going to fulfill your ministry, you're going to have to be able to keep your mind clear and out from underneath the control of other things. Keep your head, Timothy. Be clear-minded. Not that sleepy, groggy, distracted, or riled up, or lathered up about other things, but be focused. Do you hear us? He's calling for that kind of clear-minded focus. And on top of that, he then goes from be sober-minded, but also endure suffering. And the words here are used frequently for the hardships of military service. We've talked about this word in the past. Hardships of military service is as if he's saying, walk the road, Timothy. Like, go all the way. Be ready to persevere. Walk the road of Jesus Christ who went to Calvary and invited us to pick up a cross and to follow him. And he's saying you're going to endure, hold up under it, keep going. Remember now, remember what Paul himself is going through. Chapter 2, verse 9, he talks about this gospel for which he is, same word, suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Paul is sitting in a prison cell saying, I'm going right on through what I have to walk through. To represent the name of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, you be ready for whatever else is coming your way. Endure suffering. Know that it's coming. And then walk that road. Bearing up underneath it. Be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do evangelist work, he says. And it's interesting. Just kind of think about the words here. I mean, he literally is using a word for work. Do the work of an evangelist. Did you guys catch that? How many of you go to work throughout the week? Like most hands, right? We've got to live. There are efforts that we put in that are needful and that are part of how we live our lives. And he's connecting to this idea of evangelist, which we'll get to in a second. He's connecting actually the idea of, of labor, of toil, of energies expended for something. It has to do with an act. It has to do with doing and so it involves real actions and real efforts. So if you think that evangelism is kind of just an idea in our minds, get ready because you might have to sweat for it. Some of you yesterday might know what I'm talking about in the sunshine <laughs> trying to meet people. It's kind of like this. If the idea of evangelism is to be the one who, who brings along or be a bringer of good tidings, of good news, I was thinking of this picture of like, like, a, like freight. Okay? So you've got a big old truck, and you want to be able to carry something to bring it somewhere. But in order to do that, there's all this work involved. Like, you've got to load the truck. You've got to get out the forklift. You've got to have other people involved to say, what are we going to put on there? And there's all this tying down and getting prepared. So there's preparation and execution for the loading and the logistics, and there's the travel, and there's figuring out what route I'm going to take, and making sure I've got the right permits, and there's all this like activity that's necessary just to get a load from point A to point B. It doesn't just happen. Somebody's got to actually put in the doings to make it happen. I worked for a while for a steel fabrication company in Texas, and trucks would come, and trucks would go, and they didn't just load themselves. We had guys and gals who are involved in the shipping office, making sure that labels are printed and information is involved and people that are 
working with machinery to get it on there. And all of that was just so we could get something from point A to point B. Now, if you think about the, the bearing of good tidings, this good news that, that somebody's got, and we want to get it from here to there, we want to get it out so others can know, that's the idea of evangelism. We've got to recognize there's certainly going to be some work involved. Some planning, some thinking, some activity where like, it's got to happen. So, I talked about July 10th earlier during the announcements. We could, we could do the work of a car show. There's work involved. Some of you will come and you'll, you'll help park cars. And some of you will, will be in the sunshine, like setting up tents. And there's going to be some activity, right? But this isn't just do the work, like just go get sweaty. This is the do the work of an evangelist. And if we just do work, but we really have nothing to offer, it's like getting the truck ready but sending it empty. There's got to be some substance, something that you're actually sending out to be received. And that is the message of the gospel. It is the good news that Jesus Christ came to save the lost. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God who stepped into our reality to deal with the fact that we as rebellious ones pushing God away needed a Savior because we couldn't fix ourselves up enough to get back to God where all the source of life is. It's really good news that God would do His work to come for us on a rescue mission. Amen. To seek and to save the lost. And that news and figuring out how to word it and declare it and teach it from the scriptures to bring it out to others requires some work. Who's going to receive it? How are we going to find them? Are they going to walk into these doors or are they going to live their lives out there never knowing that something's going on in this room? So, he tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Be the bringer of good tidings, the herald of salvation. That's what the word means. And Philip was called Philip the Evangelist in Acts 21, verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 4, the role of evangelist, the one who does this kind of thing, especially, is called out in Ephesians chapter 4. But listen, I don't know that we should waste time like splitting hairs over offices or roles or gifts or whatnot. We're called to represent Jesus Christ, are we not? Yes. You are his ambassadors. Like, here's a kingdom that you represent that's a heavenly one and an eternal one and a lasting one. And if you're in it, then he's also employed you to say, go tell others because I want others to be in this kingdom. So you are like my representative, like an ambassador out in the world. So... We don't have exemptions. We don't need to be looking for, well, that's like a role that somebody has. Do the work of that evangelist guy. And that's I'm glad he's doing that. Now, there are special gifts to that. And there's a space for that in a church where God has employed some to do that in particular ways. But listen, it's for all of us. So let me give you something as I think about this evangelist work. There's three things that are necessary. Prayer, people, and presentation. I think if you don't have those things, we've got some freight missing. Do the work of an evangelist. Listen, there's a special kind of work. It's called getting on your knees. Because no one can save but God alone. If you believe that that's true, that God is the author and the finisher of salvation, then you have to cry out to him if you want to see him do that work in somebody else's life. And that takes time. It takes intentionality. It takes prayer. Do the work an evangelist, I'm willing to bet that part of Timothy's work was to be praying and crying out and having his heart broken to say, somebody out there that I know is not going to be in this kingdom, they're going to miss out if they don't hear the good news and I want to see it get to them. What will it take? What logistics have to be worked out? But before anything else, we're going to be crying out to God because he saves, not us. Prayer. But see, the next piece is it's great to be praying, and, but it's about people. God made every single person, specifically in his image, with a purpose to be a worshiper of the living God. And every person who is living under the, the, the problem of sin that every human is dealing with, they're currently locked out from the opportunity to really be doing that. They're missing out on what they were made for. So the question is, who are the people? Where are the people? How do we get to the people? 
And that's why we, we try stuff. Sometimes you just got to do something or you can meet a new person. Even if it takes loading up a couple of grills and blowing up some bouncy houses and staying in the sun and playing with some kids and flipping some burgers. Because why? Because the people are out there. They don't know. You guys did that yesterday. People. All it is is opportunities to connect with people. But let's say it's great to meet people. You can shake their hand and talk about the weather and say all is well. But without prayer and without people and without presentation, again, there's a message. The gospel is not just an ephemeral idea. It's a, it's a message. It has words that explain who Jesus is. He's the centerpiece of it all. He did the work to save. And it requires knowing of that in such a way that I can believe on who he is and what he's done in order to respond by turning away from sin and responding to God with a trust. So, prayer and people and presentation, all of them have to be there. Now, I would say we're talking about some event kind of things. That's an obvious, like, work-oriented kind of thing. But listen, it's not necessarily the bread and butter of evangelism. That's just, that's just tossing seed as broadly and widely as we can. But what we need to have is relational connections with people so I've earned the right to be heard, and around here, I want to just remind you, one of the tools that we have to kind of keep us in that gear, that each one of us are bearers of the gospel, missionary disciple makers, ambassadors for Christ. We, this simple little tool, it's called an I3 list. It's a bookmark where you can say, who's in my life? This is about people. And so you think about Ruth, who's in my family, relationships, who do I already know through work or being a neighbor or whatnot. Or even my routines further out in the community. Are there places that I go regularly and I see these people and give them a nod and they know who I am? From those circles, we, we discern, God, who are some people in my life that might, might be far from you? They might not even know this message. And then you put three names and you just love them by prayer. God, I don't know who else might be crying out on behalf of this one, but I am. I'm standing between you and them in intercession, asking you to do what only you can do. And then it's called an I3 list because it stands for three I's. It's about investing, that's getting to know and spending time with people. It's about inviting. There are times where just come and see, come and see. See Jesus, people, and how they live and what that's all about. Be in my home. Come to this little event. Maybe some kind of connection, maybe a sermon, whatever it might be, to be an invitational people, investing in people, inviting people, but also introducing. And that goes right along with this presentation. I might be the best one to be able to introduce you to Jesus Christ. There's no pressure. All you got to do is say, this is the guy. Here's what he's done. Some of you know we're trying that on Wednesdays, to sit at a coffee shop and give an opportunity for people who might have questions and doubts and and we're trying to just simply do that. Let me introduce you to Jesus. We'll look at the book of Mark, ask some questions, spend some time. You could do that on your own. You could do that with us. You could do that in all kinds of ways. But I just wanted to say, as we talk about evangelist work, and Paul is reminding Timothy, this is a part of what you do, Timothy. I just wanted to give you some concrete things to be thinking on in your own life. And to say, is God worthy? Yes, he is. This is what we want to see happen. We want to see Jesus Christ lifted up and him change people's lives. Bring them back into a relationship with the source of life himself. The living God. And that can't happen without a cross that deals with a sin issue. And without a change that says that I'm turning from an old man and I'm believing in repentance and faith. So. That's a little bit about what he's telling Timothy, but... In the end, in a way, I kind of like the way Paul works because he likes lists, which means that he likes words, and he likes lots of words, and I kind of do too, because I think here's what, what Paul is doing in these four things. He says, okay, Timothy, here's what you're going to be about. You're going to be clear-minded. You're going to know, man, I, I just want to know exactly what the truth is and let that come through clearly without any distractions, without anything else kind of taking over and owning my thoughts clear-minded, you're going to be ready for the road of Christ to endure and to walk it with perseverance. You're going to be doing the work of an evangelist that might be somewhat specific to Timothy, but we know it's for all of us. And in the end, he just says, fulfill your ministry. 
And I think Paul is sort of encapsulating. Here's a list of things that kind of, kind of finish up with this idea of, how do I say it? Fulfill your ministry to me. And he's going to do this again in a moment. This idea of a list that kind of culminates and here's the whole thing. But he's telling Timothy, fulfill your ministry. It's personal. Let's talk about that for a moment. I, I, I was preparing this sermon this week. And if you haven't been in my office, come see me sometime. But I now have a picture of my dad on one of my shelves. My dad was a pastor. He was a chaplain in the Air Force. And the picture of my dad seems sort of unassuming. He's sitting at a desk with stuff around him, and it's just there he is at a desk. Why do I have that picture? Because my dad, as a pastor, as a, a lover of Jesus Christ and a proclaimer, he fulfilled his ministry before he went home to be with the Lord. And I look at that, and I'm just thinking, as I sit at my desk doing the work that it takes to try and understand the passage and bring it out to you, he did the same thing. And in the background, on a pin board, there are pictures of young men that he met and he spent significant time with and he discipled and he said, walk with me, I'll show you the road. And to this day, one of the pictures, I can see the guy, he looks as young as can be and now he's not young, but he's in ministry doing the same. Pass this on to faithful men who will then be able to pass it on to others. My dad fulfilled his ministry. So he was a disciple who made disciples and so am I to be. And so are you. Now, you might be, as he talks about, fulfill your ministry. To me, you might be picturing people who are like in ministry. You know what I mean by that? People who get paid to spend time like doing like Jesus stuff. But I think what he means by this as he talks to Timothy is he says, listen to me, there's things that are just for you. And the word ministry here isn't referring to like an organization you write a check to. As a nonprofit or as a church or something, not that ministry. He says, fulfill your service. It's the same word we use for the word deacons, servants. Fulfill that part of your life that's all about thinking on others and serving them. And fulfill has to do with this idea of filling it out. It's not yet complete, so keep pouring until it, it flows out. Fulfill your ministry. So we need to think in our lives in terms of every member ministry. Every member ministry. That means that you're a missionary disciple maker. That means you have a part. That means there's something specific about it that's only something you can do. That all of us have a part. That's why the scriptures talk about the idea of a body. With Jesus Christ as the head and all of us as working parts interrelated and functioning together. And if one part of the body is not functioning, then it's not functioning fully and properly. So when it says fulfill your ministry, you're thinking, what, what am I to be about? How's that supposed to work? First of all, we have some baseline stuff to work from. We have the Great Commission where we're called to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything that Jesus taught us. 2 Corinthians 5, which I already mentioned. He has given not just Timothy, not just Paul, not just titled, leading like people who do it for their day job. He has given us the ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, of repairing relationships between lost humans and their living God who loves them so much he would die for them. So we have this shared call to make disciples, and we have this shared call to build the body. I mentioned a moment ago Ephesians chapter 4. And in Ephesians chapter 4, there's this idea, verse 11, that he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to do what? To equip the saints, the holy ones, the set apart ones. That's you and that's me if you're in Christ. For the work of ministry. Same word. We're called to be equipped Specific ways by specific ones to be ready to do the serving, the doing what it takes to build up the body of Christ. A body and its developing is adding, cells are multiplying, life is happening. God is building up a church. There needs to be others that need to be a part of this. If there's an empty space next to you in a pew, that means there's space for more. 
others who could be a part of the overall thing of like glorifying God. So, let me give you a few observations about this first part. What are you to do? As Paul says this to Timothy, and we can take notes for ourselves. Fulfill your ministry. And here's some observations. First of all, it's personal. Your ministry. It's something only you can do. That you've got specific giftings. You've got access into lives that nobody else does. It's personal. But listen, it's not selfish. You see the difference? It may be about my ministry specifically, but it doesn't mean it's about me. Because it's about serving. And serving by nature is about the needs of others. So it may be your ministry, but it's about what your life can be for others. It's personal, but it's not selfish. Also, it's incomplete, but it's not impossible. Fulfill. That means that there's more room for filling up and filling out what this looks like in our lives. So it's incomplete. There's more yet to be done in my life, in your life. But it's not impossible. Because Paul's going to talk about, I have run my race. I have completed the journey. I have fought the good fight. You can continue to live a life that by the end, somebody might say, I want to live like that. He did it. He ran the race well. It's incomplete, but it's not impossible. It's individual. This is Paul to Timothy, but it's not alone. We've already talked about that. He's saying to Timothy, you do this with others who call on the Lord. You do this in the midst of community. You build up the church. The church by nature is what? It's a gathering, a collection, an assembly of others. So don't walk the journey alone, even though it's going to be something within that whole thing. It's for you personally. It's individual, but it's not alone. And finally, it's awesome. We're going to talk about the reward of this in just a moment. But it's not easy. It's awesome. But it's not easy. If somebody told you, hey, come to Jesus, and then like life's going to be rocking and it's going to be awesome all the time. They've, they've missed something. There will be challenges along the way. So no wonder then as we move on from here's what you do to this next piece about here's why. No wonder that Paul envisions a fight or a race. Let's look at where he goes next. I've been in verse 5. Let's move on to verse 6. In verse 6 he says, because why? Why do we do this? For because I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul makes it very clear. Here's why, Timothy, it's important that I'm writing this to you. Here's why, believer, that it's important that we all find our own place in this. Because, number one, Paul's not always going to be here. He says, because I won't always be here. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Now, maybe it sounds strange when he talks about himself being poured out. But this is just a picture, and it's part of worship. And it had been for a long, long time. It was an offering. In Genesis, Jacob did it after the Lord appeared to him in Genesis 35. He, he set up a pillar and he, he poured out a drink offering, oil upon him. And then later in the law of, of Moses, in Old Testament law, drink offerings were a regular part of the offerings brought to the Lord. And actually, in reality, pouring out things, having drink offerings, wasn't just a like a Jewish thing or not just a Christian thing. It was the, all the religions around had versions of this. Where they would pour out these like, libations of blood or oil or something. And it was in the worship practices of the nations all around. Why was that? Because here's the deal. Pouring out. Pouring out is symbolic of something being given up. It's symbolic of, of not using it for myself. Here I've got this thing that I might want, be it a nice cold a glass of water or a, some kind of expensive oil, whatever it is. The idea of if I've got it and then I pour it out, I'm saying it's not for me. And I'm willing to give it up, not use it for myself. It shows trust. It shows that everything that I have is being, being emptied out to the honor of someone or something. So it demonstrates, like, here's what I have for you, and what I need will have to come from you, because I'm not reserving this for myself. And Paul is speaking of himself that way, you see? My very life, God, to you, is something I'm willing to pour out and say, if you don't fill me up, then I don't have enough, but it's for you. It's to your honor. 
There's nothing reserved. There's nothing held back. So when he says, I'm being poured out, it's being, being used as a symbolism of this kind of offering that we have background for in the Old Testament. And here's the deal. We're all being poured out for something or to something. All of you pour yourself out into something. Your energies, your time, your passion, whatever gets you. Like, all of us have something. And the question is, what am I pouring myself out for? Or to whom? In whose honor? Because Romans 12, 1 tells us that if we have God's mercy in view, or He has been kind to us, then we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. He's a self-sacrifice, living up to his own words from Romans 12. And now he says, the time of my departure is near. Departure here means to, like, to, to loosen like literally to loosen like the moorings of a ship. It's time to go, so we're pulling off the ropes from the, from the place where we were anchored. And Paul knows, my life is being unloosened from the things of this earth, and it's time for my departure. Earlier in Philippians, he says that my, the time of my departure might be near, but he knows that it wasn't, and now he knows this is it. It's time. He says in Philippians 1.23, I'm hard-pressed between the two, thinking about his a previous imprisonment and his life being in danger. My desire is to be a, a depart, to unloosen and to be with Christ. And because that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you on your account. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you for your progress and your joy in the faith. At one point, Paul was saying, I know that there's a departure and I will be ready for that, but I know that also I'm going to fulfill my ministry and I haven't run my race completely. So he was ready to stay. He was ready to continue pouring himself out. But now he knows that time has come. It's as if Paul, in writing this last letter, is thinking about like legacy planning. You guys ever heard that phrase? just kind of learned a little more about it this week. Legacy planning on one financial planning website. It says a, a definition this way. Legacy planning is a financial strategy that prepares people to bequeath their assets to a loved one or next of kin after death. These affairs are planned and organized by a financial advisor. But see, I think, and I think that the scriptures show us that there are greater endowments than financial ones. There are greater things to leave behind than just the bequeathing of my assets. There are spiritual legacies. There are things that are more important than estates. What kind of person have you been in the sight of those around? And what kind of spiritual legacy, what kind of spiritual legacy planning have you done? Because Paul here is saying, I have lived this way in front of all who know me. And Timothy, now I'm leaving this to you. That's why he's talking about his departure here. Are we planning and acting with spiritual things, eternal things in mind? Friends, I, I say with a sadness in my heart, some of you know our dear sister Marlene June. She's in her last hours, if not days. I was at her house yesterday. Cancer has ravaged her body. And she could say, like Paul did, the time of my departure has come. But the scripture teaches us that this body that she's laboring in right now is just a tent. And that there are greater things than just now because if there's eternal life in Jesus Christ and she has put her faith in him. And she need not fear when that day approach. All she needs to think about is the glory that's going to be hers and the legacy she's leaving behind. And she's trusted Jesus and I met some of her family yesterday that are surrounding her. They know the priority of her life. Like Paul said, you know my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life. What would be said of you when you get to that point? Do the people around you know your aim in life? What you were pouring yourself out for and to? Brother, sister, you will not always be here. That's part of Paul's point. He's saying, Timothy, you've got to keep going, but I can't just do this with you endlessly. I'm passing the baton. I'm bringing the torch to you, and here you go. It's going to be your turn. That was one of the heavy realizations I had at the funerals I mentioned at the beginning. You see, that generation did great things for the name of Jesus Christ, and I was sitting around looking around the room thinking, it's my turn. Now, if I don't 
take up the mantle. If I don't carry the torch, who will? The same question goes for each of us. How will the kingdom of God continue to grow after your departure? How will the name of Jesus be proclaimed after you're gone? Who will pick it up, take up the mantle or the torch? What are you doing that's worth continuing anyway? And who are you taking along with you, showing what you know, and explaining about how to do it, pointing to Jesus and helping them learn to walk through the word? How will it go to another generation and to another generation unless we're readying somebody else? Paul had Timothy and Titus and many others. So it's worth asking when we realize our time is limited, what am I doing with that? Secondly, maybe you're young and you're saying, this feels like it's a long way away. Young people, do you realize... Do you realize the responsibility will come to fall on your shoulders next? That when I've preached my guts out and I get to the end, whether that's tomorrow or many years from now, that somebody in this room is going to have to be the next one to pick up the mantle and say, we're going to proclaim Christ. Do you realize that you're going to be next? Are you sitting back and just watching the adults do their thing? Or are you engaging yourself in such a way that if it were to be that next time they're gone, you know I'm going to pick up and I'm going to continue running the race? What if the person that's important in your life, whether it be mom or dad or a mentor or whatnot, what if they weren't here? Are you ready? Who will build the church? Who will share Christ? Who will advance his kingdom? Fathers, what would you say to your sons in a moment like Mothers, what would you say to your daughters as you think about your departure? Friends, what would you say to those that you care who are around you? Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, Timothy, I'm instructing you with all that I have one last time. So here's, here's what you're going to do, and here's why. Because I won't be here forever. My departure is coming. I've poured myself out. He says, I've run the race. I've completed the fight. I fought that good fight. With all the effort and all the energy and all the pain and all the joy. Not only does he say, because I won't be here forever, but he says, because it's worth it. Somebody smile, somebody think, wow, it's worth it. Because look what he says as he finishes up. Henceforth, out there, up ahead, down the road, here's what's coming. There is laid up for me, like a way better estate planning plan. Laid up for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Paul is saying, I don't regret any of it. Not the stoning, not the shipwreck, not the prison, because out there is a crown of righteousness waiting for me. This is a, a, a prize that outvalues anything else you could possibly be chasing after. The crown of righteousness. We're not looking for a payout like the world offers. It's not like we're waiting for our Mercedes Benz to be sitting there for us or our mansion like that's going to be the reward. The reward isn't mentioned as a mansion or a car or any of the golden streets or any of the rest. The reward is a crown of righteousness. Follow me. Righteousness. You see, if you can have gain righteousness, you gain it all. You cannot have the riches of God's glory if you cannot be in His presence because of unrighteousness, because sin now has separated you from God. And how can I get righteous? Am I going to start trying to wash myself up with these dirty hands? No, it'll never work. The central problem of all humanity is a righteousness problem. And Paul is saying, I have trusted Jesus for His righteousness, His perfect life, His death on the cross as a substitution for my own. And if I can have that, now not only do I have his justification whereby my, my account has been taken care of, I have been declared not guilty, but I can also live now more and more into that righteousness, and I can be waiting for when it all finishes, and he crowns me with the crown of it all, his righteousness, so I can be in the glory of God and have everything I could have ever wanted. Isn't that beautiful? Paul is saying, this road, this life, this thing, it's worth it. It's worth it. And he doesn't just say, this is my road, and I found out a little secret. He says, not only for me is there a crown laid up like that, but for all who have loved his appearing. Don't you love that? He doesn't just say, and also for you, Timothy, because you happen to be a leader. Or a no. For all 
all who have loved his appearing. Here's the deal. His appearing, his epiphany, we just talked about this. That's past. When Jesus showed up on earth, he showed up to do his mission and fulfill his part. To make the kingdom of God available for all people. Repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. He preached and John preached and the disciples preached, right? When Jesus showed up, it was his appearing. And his appearing meant salvation because he lived a perfect life. So he could go to the cross with all that perfection in tow. And he could take his perfection and offer it to you as your sin is placed upon his shoulders. And he suffers the consequences of your sin and mine. Do you love the fact that he came? Do you love the fact that he came to do that for you? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For all of you who have loved it to a point of being willing to abandon all else and turn away from sin and say, I want you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. You be Lord. And that, are, that is those who have loved his appearing. And those who have loved his past appearing also know that we can love and wait for and be anxious for his coming appearing. Because he didn't just appear for the incarnation, which I'm talking about when he showed up in flesh here. He has promised he is coming again. And we will have a second appearing. Jesus Christ will come and he will judge and he will bring together all those who are his. And those of us who are waiting for that love it. More than any of the trappings of this life, we love his appearing. And for people like that, which can be anyone, it's not a special thing. It's simply a trusting in God. For those that are weak and heavy laden, he says, come to me and I'll give you rest. So there's no special trick about it. It's simply a realization of who you are before God, standing before his holiness, saying, I don't have it. I need righteousness. But I see Jesus. I believe what he's done. And I will have that. I will receive it like a gift by faith. Nothing special about it. Available to all. And for, to all who love his appearing like that, there is also for you and for me a crown of righteousness waiting. And between now and then, what we have to do, what we have to do is like Timothy, to be clear-minded, to endure suffering, to do the work of an evangelist, the kinds of things he's called us to, basically to fulfill your ministry. Keep running the long race. Keep going, guys. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may be way out there. But Paul is equipping Timothy, getting him ready to go the long haul. So that by the end, he can say the same thing, that I have run the race, I have fought the good fight, and now, when the time is right, there's something stored up for me that's richer than anything else I could possibly imagine. So he says to Timothy, you keep the faith, because I have. And now I'm not going to be here, so I've got to pass this on to you. Now you're up, Timothy. So you find... You fulfill your ministry. Some of you are saying, I don't know what my ministry is. So I invite you to think about finding your ministry. It's just a matter of asking questions. I, I apologize if you think that the activity of our church has somehow gotten in the way. You're not sure where to be and what that means. To fulfill my ministry. What does that look like? But let me say this. Church is less a series of, of slots that we're waiting to be filled and more a body full of parts doing what they do. So as you're looking for trying to find and fulfill your ministry, let me just say to you, ask, do, try stuff. It's pretty simple, actually. You just say, I'm going to point someone to Jesus. I'm going to live out the main things that I know. And I'm going to discover more about that. And I might find he's got specific things for me. But ask about it, do something, discover about who you are and how you're wired, and you'll find and fulfill your ministry. Look to others who run the race, but remember, they won't always be here. If any of this is built on one person saying, we're going to just wait and see, that's going to just really whatever it is, good, bad, or ugly, that person will not always be there. That person is not your Lord and Savior who lasts forever. Jesus Christ is the one. And never forget Never forget, it is so worth it. I'm just trying to paint the picture along with Paul 
that if I were gone next week, that somebody here would say, who's taking up the mantle? And I don't think the time of my departure is near, and I'm not going to live like it, but I'm going to live like I want to be at the end of my race, saying the kinds of things that Paul said, and saying the kinds of things that I thought as I walked away from funerals of people who lived their lives all the way through 50 years of ministry for Jesus Christ. Never stopping. Not until their last breath. That's my plan. I'd love to have you guys come along, each one. Find and fulfill your ministry. Look to others who run the race. Remember, they won't always be with us. Never forget. It's so worth it. Let's pray. Jesus, I... I think sometimes I want to try really, really hard and get really excited to get somebody to think something I cannot. Oh, Lord. Where would we be without you? We cannot run the race without your strengthening. Jesus Christ, we remember the good news that you have done it all and you will see us through. That when we're faithless, you're faithful. That when we were sinners, you died. That you have gone ahead of us, the first fruits of resurrection from the dead. That you've equipped us all with everything that we need for life and godliness. Your divine power has granted everything that pertains to life and godliness. Through our knowledge of you, you have called us to that glory and excellence. Lord God, I thank you for the promise that we're already seated and glorified with you. That at the end of the race can be seen and known. And that you've never left us alone. That we have your spirit. So while we wonder what to do and how to do it as we realize our own weakness and as we hear you calling to us through your word, God, we also remember your redemptive solution that you have done it all and you will see us through. Oh God, this is my prayer over this body of believers. This is my prayer that they will be strengthened for the, the race marked out for them to run it with perseverance, keeping their eyes fixed on you. What else could I say and hope? I see it happening, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was praying, I was recalling before God that all of this let's go, it's not really, you can't do it. That God has given you everything that you need through Jesus Christ, through his living spirit. So as we end, we're going to remember our own deficiencies and our own sin and our own needing to call, call out to God from our knees saying, have mercy on me, O oh God, a sinner. That's the prayer that is received with the justifying, not guilty verdict. We don't come to God with all our goods and all our skills and say, God, I'm so glad I got this and I got that and I got the other. All we need is Jesus Christ. And so, as we end our service with communion, we do as he said to remember him. So I'm going to invite you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the continual reminding of these gospel truths is for you to be your fuel to keep him ingrained in your life, taken in, if you will. If you're a person who's loved his appearing, responded by faith, said, Jesus, you're my Lord, this is a moment that you'll get to share to give you a little more for the next step along the long road of the, the race marked out for you. If you're here and Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, I hope that you've been hearing me declare that there's really good news, that he has come with you in mind. And I would give you this time as we contemplate and kind of spend one last little our moment together, instead of kind of going through the, the action of like the, the bread and the juice and just kind of trying to fit in with what she wants, we're not worried about that at all. We want to invite you to consider your own heart and what will happen when you breathe your last breath and you're standing before God. What will be said of you? Will it be said that you lived for yourself or will it be said that you turned at your faith in Jesus Christ? So I'm going to grab my cup, and you can grab yours as well. 
those of us who are believers and we're going to just follow the Lord in this remembrance. Because without the cross, we have nothing. Search your hearts. Repent of what doesn't belong. Have him purge from you the, the evils that he's already won over by his cross. And let this time of remembrance be a source of strength for you. Because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 that he received from the Lord what he also delivered to them. And it's also been delivered to us. That the Lord Jesus, the one I'm talking about, all day every day, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and you might find this wafer in your cup, and it's a representative of that bread. He took bread, and he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said this, this is my body, which is broken for you. Christian, Remember that all the gifts and glories of God's grace are yours through Jesus Christ. Through his sacrifice. Let's do this in remembrance of him. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper. So full of meaning. So full of Passover symbolism about lambs and sacrifice and freedom from slavery and all that was already there. And then Jesus gave it meaning. And it wasn't just about a lamb to cover sin for a year. It was about the lamb. The once for all sacrifice. Enough for your sin, all of it, any of it, and everyone else's who can trust in him. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Believers, brothers and sisters, let's remember what it cost Jesus Christ his blood for us. For as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's love his appearing and live like it matters and live like it's coming. Let's pray. Jesus, one more time. In short prayer, deep and full of meaning. Make us into your image. Fill us, fuel us, save us from sin. Give us growth and strength and go with us as we go from here because as we have remembered your body and your blood, we want to use that to proclaim you until you come again. Give us an aim in life and something to live for. Thank you for this time together. We pray to you and love you and honor you and give you all the thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing one verse of In Christ Alone.